All right, welcome back, everybody. So I'm continuing here with chapter two. This is slide number 29. So we'll pick up here. We, uh, in the first video, talked a little bit about basic chemistry. Um, and uh, we started to talk about energy, all right? And we're gonna really look at this next process as how um, chemistry and energy uh, are basically combined, all right? So this is really high yield information. And in the next series of slides, you'll wanna know this really well because there will be detailed questions about it. Okay, so I'm gonna go through this with you. All right, so chemical reactions. We can classify chemical reactions in terms of energy. And how we do this is that we can call a chemical reaction one of two things. We can say it is an exergonic reaction or an endergonic reaction. Okay, so if it's exergonic, all right, if the chemical reaction is classified as exergonic, what that means is we have had the breaking of chemical bonds and that has resulted in a release of energy. Remember that I mentioned to always keep in mind that chemical bonds store energy. And whenever you break those chemical bonds, that energy that's stored in those bonds is released. It's released to the atmosphere to be used to do some kind of work, okay? So an exergonic chemical reaction, well, this means that there has been a release of energy. What about endergonic? Endergonic is the opposite, all right? So endergonic, this means that this is a chemical reaction that requires energy to proceed. Okay, we need to put energy into um, that chemical reaction. Okay, so for exergonic, we're having the exit of energy. Okay, exer, think like exit. Okay, we're having energy exit the uh, reaction. Endergonic means we need energy to go into. Okay, so ender, think like into, okay, or enter, something like that. Okay, kind of sounds like that. Okay, so we're gonna need energy to go into an endergonic chemical reaction. Okay, now there are two other terms that we can relate this to. So you wanna be able to use catabolic with the word exergonic interchangeably, just like you wanna use anabolic with endergonic interchangeably. And so let me explain that. So, Exergonic reactions are also classified as catabolic reactions. Now, remember, I think it was chapter one, yeah, when I mentioned a little something about metabolism and what catabolism and anabolism are. You might recall that catabolism means we're breaking something down, right? We're breaking something down. So, of course, a catabolic reaction is going to be exergonic. All right, if we're breaking a larger substance down into something smaller, for example, what we do in digestion, right? Anytime you eat something, those larger food products are broken down and broken down and broken down into their smallest pieces. And each time a chemical bond is broken through this catabolic process, energy is released, okay? So you want to um, associate exergonic reactions with the catabolic reactions, okay? So like digestion is your, a really great example of, the, of, of this situation here, right? Digestion, you're dealing with catabolism and you're dealing with exergonic reactions. So endergonic and anabolic then are the opposite, right? Okay, so anabolism I explained to you earlier is when you have the building up of something. So let's say, you want to uh, build a big protein. Well, proteins are made of amino acids. So you're gonna need to get a whole bunch of little amino acids together, form chemical bonds between all those little amino acids to build up that larger protein, right? So anabolism refers to the synthesizing of something, uh, the building up of something. And we're always building new things in our body. We're always making uh, hormones, for example. We're always making neurotransmitters in the brain. Uh, 
all kinds of things that we're, we're making. All right, and so these would be considered anabolic reactions, and they're going to be considered endergonic as well, because in order to build something larger from something smaller, well, it makes sense that you're going to need to put energy into that process. All right, energy is going to be needed in order to make something larger from something smaller. So again, you want to use these two terms interchangeably as well. All right, when we have an endergonic reaction, we're going to have a net absorption of energy coming into the reaction in order to perform an anabolic reaction. All right, so that's really the first step here with this whole process is to have an understanding um, of the definitions of these terms and how they relate, right? So like how is catabolic, how does that relate to exergonic? How does anabolic relate to endergonic? A chemical reaction is basically when we have a chemical bond formed or broken, all right? And a lot of times uh, you will see um, your chemical equation written this way. You've probably already seen this, right? Uh, so you have reactants. The reactants are on the left and the products are on the right, okay? So in this uh, case, it's showing you Substance A is going to form a chemical bond with substance B, okay? At this point, A and B are separate. They are separate entities, but then they form a chemical bond together to form a new product. So now A and B are together, and as they are existing together, they function to do something differently than A would by itself or that B would by itself. Now, in chemistry, uh, it says here all chemical reactions are theoretically reversible, theoretically. And that's what these two arrows are, are indicating, is that, that this is reversible. So just as you put A and B together to make AB, you can break AB apart to, to uh, have A by itself and B by itself, right? That theoretically, you should be able to go both ways with this. But in reality, in the human body, this is really not true, okay? So in the, in the human body, uh, uh, chemical reactions are really not very reversible. I mean, you do have situations where that can take place, but, uh, you know, you really don't have much of this happening because it just takes too much energy to go back and forth here. All right, so decomposition reactions and synthesis reactions. This is where we're going to revisit uh, some terms we've already mentioned. Okay, so a decomposition reaction, and what, just think about it. What does decomposition mean? If you think about decomposition, it's like you're breaking something down, right? So um, that's what we've been talking about here when we've been talking about exergonic reactions and catabolic reactions, right? Catabolic is a, uh, a decomposition kind of reaction. It involves breaking bonds, okay, to break larger substances down into its individual pieces. This is exergonic. Remember, we're having the release of energy because we're breaking chemical bonds here, and, and so that energy will, will be released uh, from this chemical reaction. Now, most important example for us, very important, of a decomposition reaction is hydrolysis really really important i'm going to go through hydrolysis in some detail with you here in a few so hydrolysis is really the most common form of decomposition reaction in the human body it's occurring constantly everywhere all right hydrolysis one of the most important chemical reactions that takes place in the human body now hydrolysis is a decomposition reaction, okay? It is catabolic, it is exergonic. So break the word down, okay? When it, because students get confused a lot on what is hydrolysis and how, it, how it's different from its um, opposing chemical reaction known as dehydration synthesis, which I'll get to. Hydrolysis, guys, remember, if you're having a hard time remembering what something means, try to break the word down, break the word down. Memorize the meanings of the root words and the base words so that you will understand what, what the word means. You have to understand what the word means. Okay, so hy hydrolysis, what does it mean? Hydro 
means water, lysis. Okay, whenever you see the word lysis, it means to break apart, to break apart. So what hydrolysis means is that this is a chemical reaction where we're using water to break something apart. I'll say that again. Remember your definition for hydrolysis. Hydrolysis is when we use water to break something apart. We're using water to break chemical bonds. Okay, what we're going to see in hydrolysis is that what you want to kind of look at water as, in this case, is that water is kind of like an obstacle, okay, when we're dealing with these, uh, these specific uh, types of chemical reactions. Water is like an obstacle, okay? So, what, so water is going to come in between your, um, indivi your uh, individual atoms or elements here and break them apart. Hydrolysis, water is what breaks chemical bonds. Really, 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 really important for you guys to know that, okay? Hy hydrolysis means we're using water to break things apart. And this is catabolic. So think about this when we're doing digestion, right? Why do you want to uh, have liquid with your food? Why do you, why do you need to drink water with your food? Why do you think? Why, why do you feel thirsty when you're, when you're eating food? because you need to do catabolism. You need to break that stuff down and you need water in order to do that, okay? Water is gonna be what causes the breaking of these chemical bonds and the release of energy. And I just have to say it, I'll, I'll talk more about it with ATP, but again, the importance of consuming water, all right? The importance of consuming water is this right here, is this whole process of hydrolysis. You cannot break down food for energy if you do not have water, all right? You can't, and we're going to see this when we talk about ATP, you can't use ATP for energy unless you are consuming enough water, okay? So this is the importance of water, all right? This is why they always say, oh, you need to drink so many glasses of water a day. You need to stay hydrated. Why? This is exactly why, all right? Because you need water to come in and break down the chemical bonds that exist in these larger substances that you need to get energy from, all right? All right, we're gonna see a picture of that here soon. Now, what is the opposing reaction or the opposite reaction of a decomposition reaction? This would be a synthesis reaction. So synthesis means we're, we're bringing together. Uh, the prefix S-Y-N means to come together. That's what that prefix means. Okay, so when you see S-Y-N, that's, you mean, well, we're bringing something together. Uh, we're building something, okay? We're, we're bringing individual substances together. We're, we're bonding them to make a larger product. Of course, this is classified as anabolism, right? We're building something. And this is classified as endergonic because remember, to build something up, we're going to need to put energy into that. Now, our example of a synthesis reaction um, is dehydration synthesis. Now, dehydration synthesis is just as important as hydrolysis, just as important. Now, understand, okay, definitions again here. Dehydration synthesis, so what is this reaction? What is this chemical reaction? Dehydration. Hydra, hydra, we're dealing with water. D means to remove. So dehydration, we are removing water in order to build something larger. We're removing water, and you're going to see, you really got to look at the picture to get this, all right? This is, like I said, really want to focus on, on this because a lot of students have had trouble with this in the past. Um, you know, so we need to know hydrolysis and dehydration synthesis. Okay, now remember, dehydration synthesis, it's endergonic, it's anabolic, and this is what we're using to build something larger from something smaller. And I think the reason this confuses students is because, well, if we're building something larger, why are we removing 
something, right? That's why it's confusing to you all. I understand, okay? Initially, it does not make sense. You're like, okay, how do we build something larger by removing something, okay? Well, we're gonna see how that's the case. We're gonna remove water. We're gonna remove water in order to build things up. Basic picture, what this is showing you is, well, this is a starch molecule, which, you know, I'd rather this say glycogen. <laughs> Uh, you know, for whatever reason, your book, not a big fan of the textbook, but, uh, uh, you know, starch is the storage form of energy in plants, but we're not plants. This is human physiology. We should call this glycogen. Okay. So glycogen, we'll bring it up again. Glycogen is the storage form of glucose. All right. So all this picture is showing you is that in a decomposition reaction, decomposition, all we're doing is we're taking a larger molecule, okay, or a larger compound, I should say, and we're, we're going to remove water from this. I'm sorry, we're going to add water. I got confused. Let me repeat. This is a decomposition, decomposition reaction, decompose. So that means we're going to break down this uh, larger compound into its individual units, all right? And this is what we do all the time with glycogen. We store glucose. If you have extra glucose, you're going to store that in the form of glycogen, which is just a long chain of individual glucose molecules. And when you're low on energy, then your glycogen will be broken down and you'll get uh, your individual glucose molecules. All right, so this is a synthesis reaction. Um, again, no big deal on this picture, just a basic picture showing you Okay, a synthesis reaction. So for this, we're going to use um, hydrolysis. Okay, so we're going to have our individual amino acids. We want to make a larger product. We want to make a protein. And so those will form bonds together and form this long strand of a protein. Just basic picture on that. A um, couple of definitions. Uh, and uh, side points here before I really get into um, hydrolysis and dehydration synthesis. Um, so um, basically you should know that chemical reactions will, uh, the speed of chemical reactions is going to vary based on a number of variables. So you should know that temperature, okay, if you have a high temperature, okay, if you, you're in a hot environment, then that is going to increase the speed of the chemical reaction. Okay, so high temperature, high rate of speed of the chemical reaction. Second variable that affects speed of chemical reactions is how uh, much reactant you have, okay? How, concentration of reactants. So how much is there to work on, right? So if you have a lot to work on, if you have a lot to catabolize, for example, if you have a lot to break down, then that's gonna increase the rates of that chemical reaction. Okay, so the more you have to work on, the, the uh, faster the chemical reactions will go. Particle size. So the smaller a particle is, the faster the chemical reaction will proceed. And that should make sense, all right? If you have large particles involve large molecules, large compounds, it's gonna take a little longer for that chemical reaction to process um, through all that. Catalysts, what are catalysts? So catalysts are gonna be substances that increase the rates of a chemical reaction. And our most important example of a catalyst in the human body is going to be the enzyme. Okay, enzymes are catalysts, and these are really necessary in order for us to perform all of the chemical reactions in our body in a reasonable time frame. If we did not have enzymes, it would take us all very, very long to uh, synthesize hormones or to synthesize steroids. It would take us a really long time to digest our food, for example. Macromolecules really, uh, you know, uh, this is just a definition you're probably not going to be asked about. Uh, when you see the prefix macro, it just means large. So yeah, we're dealing with large organic molecules, macromolecules. And these macromolecules have high molecular weights, okay? They weigh a lot. Polymers and polymerization. Polymers are macromolecules that are made of a lot of similar subunits. And we call the subunits that make up a polymer we call that 
we call those monomers. An example, it says starter, I, I really should change that to glucose, um, is a polymer, right? I showed you starter glucose on that previous slide. It was a polymer and, that we can break down into individual glucose monomers. Okay, so that would be an example of that. Polymerization is simply when the monomers join together. All right, so here's the real hard stuff that students struggle with. So I want to spend a few minutes on it. All right, we're going to go uh, in detail through these two really important chemical processes, dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis. So let's look what it says here. Actually, let me go to the picture because I think it will be better that way first. All right. Let's look at the bottom one here, all right? The bottom one is looking at hydrolysis. Let's talk about that since we talked about that one first. Hydro, water, lysis to break something apart. So we're gonna add water to break something apart. Okay, now look at this little picture here. It's showing a dimer. A dimer is simply a very general word for two substances linked together, okay? So this is two of whatever, it doesn't matter what it is. Maybe this blue one here is an, uh, one amino acid and the orange one here is a second amino acid, whatever. But here in hydrolysis, what we have is we have a larger product, that's the point. And what we wanna do with this larger product is we wanna break it down into its individual parts, okay? We wanna break it down into its individual monomers. So, we're going to do this by adding water. What do we want to do? We want to break these apart. See, look at this oxygen down here. <coughs> Excuse me. Look at this oxygen down here. This oxygen is holding these two substances together, right? There is a chemical bond here that is present, okay? There is existing here a chemical bond. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take water, okay, H2O, we're gonna take water and we're gonna add it to the substance, okay? We're gonna take water and we're gonna put it right here. We're gonna add it to the substance. Now, remember I said, think of water as like an obstacle, okay? The water then, all right, we're adding water, so because look over here, we've got H2O, we've got, we added one of the H's from, high, from uh, water to this monomer, and we added the second hydrogen from water and the oxygen to the second monomer. Okay, so notice shaded in blue, H2O. So in this case, when we add water, water is serving as an obstacle that comes in between these two uh, monomers, okay? It's an obstacle. It serves as an interference. Think about that. Water interferes, okay, with chemical bonds. That's something that you, some way you might remember it, okay? Water is an obstacle. When you add that water, it interferes, okay? So the point is water breaks chemical bonds, that is the point, okay? Whenever you add water, you're breaking chemical bonds, okay? You're breaking something larger down into something smaller because water interferes. It interferes with this uh, chemical bond here. Now, uh, take that to your universal knowledge that water is the greatest solvent in the universe or that we know of, right? Water. Why is it the greatest solvent? Why does it dissolve everything? Because it interferes with the chemical bonds existing between the substances there, okay? So hydrolysis, you're using water, you're adding water, adding it to break something apart. Now let's look at the top here, dehydration synthesis. So in dehydration, look, dehydration, we're going to remove water in order to synthesize something. We're going to remove water. Remember in hydrolysis, we added water. In dehydration synthesis, we're going to do the opposite. We're going to take away water. 
in order to make something larger. Okay, so up top here, what are we starting with? Remember that what we want to do is we want to synthesize. We want to build something larger from smaller pieces. So it's showing you here, we have one monomer here, another monomer here. They're not bound together. Okay, they are not together. But you'll notice, right, monomer one has a, look at that little H shaded in blue. Monomer two has an H and an O shaded in two. Notice this collectively is H2O, water. Okay, so for dehydration synthesis, what we want to do is we want to form a chemical bond between monomer one and monomer two. We want them to join together because we're building something larger. So we have to remove the obstacle. Remember that water is like an obstacle. When it comes to chemical bonds, water is an obstacle. If water is present here, you cannot form a chemical bond between these two monomers because it interferes with the ability to do so. All right. So we're going to build something larger. So guess what? Let's take away H2O then. And now we're able to, uh, you know, form this chemical bond because water has been taken out of the picture. So we now have this larger substance. We are now able to synthesize because we are removing water. All right, uh, let me go back to the slide because this in, is um, just in words what I already said, I hope. Right, so dehydration synthesis is the loss of water from a chemical reaction. Or I'm, I'm sorry, it's the loss of water from larger molecules, from smaller molecules to build larger molecules. Let me restate that because I don't think that sounded right. All right, uh, but you should know now dehydration synthesis what it is it is the loss of water okay and we're doing this because we want to remove the obstacle water is an obstacle we want to remove any interference between monomers trying to build together to form a polymer okay um, all this is uh, illustrated on that previous slide okay hydrolysis again is the addition of water to do the opposite process in order to break something down. Covalent, uh, don't worry about that too much. Um, basically, you know, what's your definition here? We're splitting a polymer or we're breaking a larger product down into smaller pieces by the addition of a water molecule. Remember, we're going to add water to break something apart. Uh, let me just quiz you real quick and see if you all in your head can remember this. So if we have hydrolysis, do you think that is an endergonic or exergonic reaction? Is hydrolysis endergonic or exergonic? Well, in hydrolysis, what are we doing? We're breaking something larger into something smaller. So we have to break chemical bonds to do that. So we broke a chemical bond here. And remember, if we're breaking chemical bonds, energy is released from that. So that would mean that a hydrolysis reaction is classified as exergonic. Exergonic. Energy will be released when that chemical bond is broken here between um, these two entities. What else? Is hydrolysis considered to be an anabolic or a catabolic reaction? Well, we're breaking something down, so it's catabolic. So you should be able to associate those terms all together. Hydrolysis okay, is a chemical reaction that's classified as exergonic and catabolic. Dehydration synthesis, so I'm, I'm sure you can say in your head to me now or to yourself, whatever. Um, dehydration synthesis, is this considered to be an exergonic or endergonic reaction? Exergonic or endergonic? Well, we're building something larger, so we're going to need energy to go into this process. So um, this would be an endergonic. Okay, we're going to need energy. Okay. And of course, we're building something larger from something smaller. So this is classified as an anabolic, anabolic reaction, right? So you should be able to associate dehydration synthesis with being an endergonic reaction, 
as well as being an anabolic reaction. The next slide is the last slide I'll present to you for this video. And it's just another picture of dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis. Just another way to look at it. Okay, so remember, and I'm just going to review this again. Dehydration synthesis, okay, we're, dehydration means we're going to remove water. Okay, so we're going to take this OH off of this monomer and an H off of this monomer. That's H2O. We're going to remove water from that system. That removes any interference that was previously existing between monomer one and monomer two. Once that interference or that obstacle is gone, now they can join together to form a larger product. Hydrolysis, we're going to add water to break something apart. Remember, dehydration synthesis, we're removing water to build something up. Hydrolysis, we're adding water to break something down. Okay, so in hydrolysis, we're trying to break this larger product down. We're trying to break this bond here. So we're going to add water. And remember, water is an obstacle. Water is an obstacle when it comes to the ability of other substances to form chemical bonds with one another. That is why water is the greatest solvent we know of. It breaks bonds. Okay. Therefore, it breaks things down. All right. Now, this uh, example here is a more detailed example uh, involving um, carbohydrates. You don't have to know the details of that at all. Okay. It's just showing you, like, if you wanted to see, like, um, you know, a more specific example, then that's there for you. But you will not get specific questions about this uh, when it comes to carbohydrates, like, you know, uh, <laughs> Where, where, where is the water taken from glucose and stuff like that? Don't worry about it. The top two here, this is your general idea of what these things are. Okay, so make sure you, you know those. And I do think it helps to, to look at these pictures when you're trying to remember what these terms mean. All right. And actually, that's all I have for you for this video because, let me make sure really quick. Yeah, that's it for this video. Uh, so you will have a third video on this chapter, a third and last one. And um, uh, we pick up here on this slide when we start that. So that'll be slide, what, 40, right? Or I'm sorry, 39. All right, guys. Well, um, that's probably the shortest video you'll ever have. <laughs> have a great day. Bye.